Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're recapping this week in cannabis news from September 27th to October 3rd. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos, and there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up that you think might have potential and then take advantage whenever you're ready. And we're going to start with the news you were anticipating as this is a small victory but another crucial step as the bill to federally legalize cannabis was approved by a key house committee on Thursday. Uh, the Marijuana Opportunity Reinve Reinvestment and Expungement More Act cleared the House Judiciary Committee, which is chaired by the legislation sponsor, Rep. Gerald Nadler, on a 26-15 to 15 vote. The tally fell, fell largely along party lines, with all Democrats supporting the measure and all but two Republicans voting against it. The development comes one week after the full House voted in favor of a defense spending bill that includes an amendment that would protect banks and service state legal cannabis businesses from being penalized from federal regulators. So while we got this victory of SAFE being added into the NDAA, we also got this victory so thank you Amazon for pushing on the lobbying efforts as well um, but this was good to see this go through now that's really all highlighted from the article I believe next step is this going into the house if you want to go through it you can see just basically the nonsense that went on uh, in this committee though it was like watching a high school play except instead of the students with potential acting it was the teachers uh, and they were all not very good at acting and they forgot their lines <laughs> it was just ridiculous so it just reminds you why it's so complicated and it can take time to get all this done um, but we got what we wanted out of that on Thursday, so just happy to relay this. As we move over to this other article from Marijuana Moment, Chuck Schumer says key senators have agreement not to advance cannabis banking reform before legalization. And while taken at face value, these words don't sound great, I think it's really important to read between the lines, because we knew Schumer was never going to pass SAFE as a standalone, and what's really important is how much progress is he actually making on getting the votes to add a little bit of comprehensive reform. So just want to read through this a little bit. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he and colleagues working to advance a federal cannabis legalization bill have an agreement that the body will not take up cannabis banking legislation until more comprehensive reform advances. That said, so I think this is the important part, that said, he's open to exploring an alternative way of advancing banking reform if lawmakers are able to incorporate social equity provisions of legalization, such as expungement for prior cannabis convictions. And I'm pretty sure this can just be done if you add removing cannabis from the CSA. Like if you just remove it and deschedule it, I think that would take care of this. So if they can somehow just get descheduling added with SAFE, um, it's possible that they would move forward with that into separate defense policy legislation that the chamber will be taking up soon. And so whether either proposal would be embraced by President Joe Biden uh, if they were sent to his desk is yet to be seen, and that's a whole other issue. Mind you, I'm sure he's not going to go against his own party, but Schumer says he's going to be lobbying heavily with him on legalization. So I just want to play this clip from a podcast. I would recommend listening if you want to find more information because uh, it's about a 10-minute clip fully. I'm not going to play all that, but I'm just going to let Schumer relay um, the most up-to-date uh, info he's given us. And so we think that the quickest way to get it all done is do it together. If you let just the banking provisions pass, it'll make it much harder to get more Republicans and more conservatives on the bill. We're trying to create a coalition for comprehensive reform. So l let me play a bit of devil's advocate here because I'm, I'm torn on this issue myself. But in point of fact, right, you know, the legalization thing, I mean, the more act going through the Congress last year, it was almost like a magical moment where everything came together and even the yeah. activists were surprised it went through so fast. So the question here is, you know, I hear people say, well, it's going to be the fat cats, the big guys who are going to benefit the most from safe banking. And dollar wise, that's true. But proportionally, it's probably the little guys, including some of the ones we want to help through all the social racial equity stuff who are going to benefit. Isn't there a maneuver here where perhaps safe banking gets combined with some elements of your legalization bill? Ethan, we would look at that if we could, you know, I mean, we have said our bill's a study bill and we're looking for suggestions and changes. And certainly, you know, we're not saying the bill has to be exactly as is, right. but to just allow the banking bill through I think is going to I hear you. Is there a way through this whole National Defense Authorization Act to add on some of the social equity, the expungement, those sort of provisions to the safe banking Great thing question. when you guys get to conference committee? Well, it's, it's you know, look, everything should be explored. And if people on in, in the Senate can add some things on, that would make it more of a palliative. But again, um, I think I don't want to bargain against myself here. We need comprehensive reform. That's what we need. We need, we need legalization, 
And um, we're going to fight hard that way. Uh, with our friends in the banking industry who want to fund things, we get that, and we're, we're fine with that. And I agree, some of that would flow, by the way. But if you don't have real provisions in the bills, um, that makes sure that funding, wherever it comes from, whether it's through taxes and government or through banking, gets to the communities who are hurt the most. You know the way water goes downhill and it's going to go to all of the easy, fat cat, more well-to-do people. So you've got to be really careful about that. That's true, but the fat cats do have better access to capital and they're able to work around this stuff. They do. They do. Look, I'm not arguing against the specifics. I'm just telling you that it's my view that if we, if we are in range of getting comprehensive reform and we're making great progress, and remember, as majority leader, I can determine what's put on the floor. McConnell said he'd never put a, a legalization or decriminalization bill on the floor. I will when we get the votes and build the coalition. Yeah. And the Banking Act will be part of that coalition. Right, but you got a lot of recalcitrant Democrats. I mean, you look at it. And so, I mean, the hope would be that he can get that done by April 2022, because 420, he said, I hope to have cannabis decriminalized or legalized by this time next year. So it sounds like he's optimistic that they're actually getting closer to the votes, but we're going to have to wait and see. Obviously, that's not what we want to hear. But I'm optimistic. I'm trying to read between the lines, and I don't see this as him saying safe is never going to pass. It's just his, he's exploring his options, um, and we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. But this is the most up-to-date recent info we've gotten from Schumer. Uh, this is the Psychoactive Podcast from Ethan Nadelman, who's a very well-known cannabis advocate. Ad activists. So I'd recommend tuning in if you want to hear more. But um, so that's it from this article. Again, a headline that looks bad, but I think it's important to read between the lines. So that's why I just want to add, it to add that extra context. And then this news, former Justice Department official and GOP senator joined cannabis group as legalization advances in Congress. So a former top Justice Department official under the Obama administration and a former GOP senator are joining an advisory board of major cannabis industry group. The National Cannabis Roundtable announced on Thursday that former Deputy Attorney General James Cole and former Senator Cory Gardner will be advising the organization as it advocates for federal cannabis reform. And Cole is well known within the cannabis community for issuing a memo during his time at DOJ that laid out cannabis enforcement priorities for federal prosecutors that generally deprioritize going after people acting in compliance with state laws. Now, former Attorney General Jeff Sessions rescinded the guidance during his time in the Trump administration. Then sadly, however, it has yet to be reinstated by the Biden administration's Department of Justice. Which also brings up the question, what if the current Attorney General just reenacted the Cole memo? Would banks then be allowed to service cannabis businesses without fear of federal prosecution? It's possible, although it hasn't been done. Could be an option. And for advocates, it's encouraging, though, to see people enter into an advisory role for federal cannabis reform who actually push for policy changes on the issue. It breaks with the trend of former politicians who are unhelpful or hostile against legalization when they were in office, joining the industry in some capacity and just taking advantage of making money. So uh, good to have more pro-cannabis uh, leaders join into the cannabis space. Well, we have this from Todd Harrison. Need him on U.S. cannabis, uh, MSO industry growth and valuations versus other industries. Now, this is not all industries, of course, but if we look at compounded annual growth rate from industry sales from 2019 to 2022, there is one group that is the outlier, and the outlier, and that is what we are holding out for. The eventual re-rating of these U.S. multi-state operators, which seems to be a when, not if scenario. And then on to this snippet I did want to read through from Needham. This has been a gangbuster year for fundamentals with the industry on pace to grow 25 to 35 percent. MSO revenue is likely to grow 2x and EBITDA set to grow 2.4x. We believe the most logical outcome for cannabis equities is that the share prices will ultimately reflect fundamentals. Let me say that one more time. We believe the most logical outcome for cannabis equities is that the share prices will ultimately reflect fundamentals. That's what I've been saying all along, although it's taken longer, uh, obviously, than we'd likely have hoped. Doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. Equity performance for the group this year has been tied to expectations of federal reform that must come from a legislative assembly that most objective observers uh, would likely conclude is neither logical nor predictable. Given popular support, the substantial economic impact from the industry in terms of local tax revenue and job creation and the degradation of the illicit market, we continue to believe that federal reform reforms are a matter of when, not if. This half-in, half-out regime as a conservative Supreme Court justice recently noted, results in a contradictory and unstable state of affairs that strains basic principles of federalism. While these strains will only increase with industry growth, the inability of the Washington political system to self-organize and enact reform the most, on most issues leaves the path to enacting cannabis reform uncertain. That said, for the MSOs, the longer it takes for federal reform to occur, the deeper the competitive moat will be for these companies, which also means the more fundamentally healthier and the better positioned they will be. 
For the Stocks, we consider federal reform as something akin to a warrant embedded in the equity that will materially re-rate the multiple should reform occur. Even if federal reform doesn't occur over the midterm, we believe that the valuation is low enough to provide support for the stocks, and we believe the equity will rate higher on the 50% annual EBITDA growth we expect to see out of MSOs for at least the next few years. So that's very positive out of Needham, so I wanted to relay that. Um, and this is another visual we can look at. Fundamentals remain strong. All the decline has been due to valuation contraction. The fundamental outlook for the group is unchanged, but valuation has declined materially on the equity pullback. And with that, we jump over to the Office of Medical Cannabis Use for the state of Florida, and we take a look. Qualified patient count jumped up to 619,228, which means they added 3,342 patients over the last week. And from September 27th to October 1st, uh, AltMed Florida, which is owned by Verano, did open another location in Pinellas Park. But if we scroll down to take a look at the amount of milligrams of THC sold, milligrams of CBD sold, and ounces of smokable flour sold, this is a record across the board, uh, especially for True Leave, but most companies. So just going to leave that there. These are very strong numbers uh, as sales continue to be strong in a medical-only state. So it shows a lot of potential for Florida. On to the big news of the week, though, or at least the big news of Friday that we weren't expecting um, and didn't necessarily get the love that it should have gotten. But fact is, True Leave completes acquisition of Harvest Health and Recreation creating the largest and most profitable U.S. cannabis operator. And so we're going to go through some highlights, but firstly, just want to show you something very interesting. So if we jump over to the uh, Cannabis Investor Portal from MJ Stock Trader, we take a look now. Cureleaf is valued at $8.4 billion, uh, fully diluted market cap. And now if we look at Trueleaf, who has now just become more profitable and has more revenue than Cureleaf, uh, they're valued at $5.2 billion. And so, yes, th that's quite a gap. And all I can really say with this is that True leave is very cheap, and in the coming weeks, there's no reason to believe that True leave is not gonna rise up in price to meet Cure leaf just based on the new fact, the facts of this new entity that has just been combined. So, just want to share that with you. True leave is still cheap. Not advice, but consider trying to get it while you can. So, we're gonna go through just some of the highlights. What this does, it increases sale across our hub markets, creates at time of closing the largest U.S. cannabis operator across a combined retail and cultivation footprint basis with depths and key markets solidifies position as the most profitable U.S. MSO, establishes an outstanding platform of profitability and cash generation for continued growth, positioning the company to execute on near-term opportunities in existing markets as well as future catalysts at both state and federal levels, provides leading financial metrics, reinforces superior financial performance relative to peers by delivering the strongest public company financial results among any U.S. reporting MSO. In the second quarter 2021, truly reported revenues of $215.1 million, net income of $40.9 million, and adjusted EBIT of $9 94.9 million. And Harvest reported revenues of 102.5 million, net loss before controlling interest of 19.2 million, and adjusted EBIT of 28 million. On a combined basis, in the second quarter, True Leave and Harvest had 317.6 million, which beats Cure Leaf 312 in reported revenue, the highest among U.S. public reporting companies. Delivers an exceptional retail and wholesale distribution model offers a robust network of 149 dispensaries across 11 states and three strategic uh, regional hubs with market-leading positions in Arizona, Florida, and Pennsylvania, strengthens industry-leading balance sheet, combines True Leave and Harvest's strong cash and cash equivalents of $289 million and $70 million, respectively, as, June th or as of June 30th, 2021, bolstered by True Leave's recently announced $350 million debt financing and Harvest's $55 million proceeds from the sale of its Florida license to Planet 13, I believe, and extends product and selection brands, adds a successful line of Harvest brands, including Alchemy and Roll One, across multiple form factors to True Leaf's portfolio uh, of in-house brands and national brand partners, and lastly, leverages experience and best practices, which combines proven management teams with established track records, enhancing operational excellence across cultivation, manufacturing, and retail. So although it did not get the love it should have gotten on Friday, I definitely think it will get the love in the coming months because on top of that, they also announced 350 million private placement of 8% senior secured notes, which is a form of debt. And so they announced that it has received commitments from a private placement. So this isn't a public offering. This is a private investor uh, of 8% senior secured notes due 2026 for aggregate gross proceeds of 350 million. The notes, which will be issued at 100% of face value, will be senior secured obligations of the company and will rank peri passu with the senior secured outstanding notes of the company maturing at 20 2024. The notes will bear an interest rate of 8% per annum, which is again one of the industry's lowest, showing that the cost of capital for this industry is going down 
payable semi-annually in equal installments until the maturity date unless earlier redeemed or purchased. And the main idea though is that just means investors are willing to take more risk or give out money for less interest rate because they believe that the risk the risk has gone down um, in itself. So this leverages the leading industry balance sheet uh, to provide a retirement of certain harvest and health recreation debt upon completion of the acquisition. So very uh, strategically beneficial, especially to pay off some of Harvest's debt um, and keep Truly's balance sheet as healthy as it always has been. So on to that from other MSOs, Cureleaf to report their third quarter 2021 financial and operational results on November 8 after market close. So I think that's a Monday, not a Friday. Okay, so that's a Monday, 5 p.m. So we're going to start off the week with Cureleaf, which is great. Then Green Thumb announced that they will hold their third quarter 2021 earnings conference call on November 10th, 2021. Um, this is also going to be after market close in the evening. So it seems that is the trend. On to Cresco as they announced that they will release their third quarter 2021 financial results on November 11th. They are going to be doing this Thursday uh, at market open. So this will come uh, after Green Thumb. And then we have Columbia Care to report third quarter 2021 results on Friday, November 12th. And this will come at 8 a.m. in the morning as well. So as of there, we've got four MSOs uh, releasing their earnings announcements. Um, we don't have Truly Verano yet, but uh, what's great to consider or to remember at least is that Tilray is supposed to release their earnings on the 7th. Uh, and hopefully those should be better than last time, just based on the summer sales that we saw in Canada. And then with that, just a reminder that again, earnings never stop. So MSOs are gonna be reporting their numbers in November and those are gonna be a sight. So excited for that. Columbia Care commences cultivation operations at 34 Acre Long Island, New York facility, preparing for upcoming introduction of whole flower program. So they have announced that one of the largest and most experienced cultivators, so they're calling themselves this, uh, of course has received approval from the New York State Department of Health to commence cultivation and processing operations at its new facility in Eastern Long Island, New York. The first harvest is planned for Q4 of 2021. So despite the delays Cuomo um, created, with the new governor coming in and trying to get the ball rolling, it just shows that companies as well, like we saw with Green Thumb, like we see with Columbia Care, they're executing. They're continuing to get the ball rolling as well, anticipating that things are going to launch, hopefully on schedule, sooner than later would be better. Um, then onto this from Air Wellness, launches Sun Gems THC infused gummies throughout Florida footprint. Um, Air Wellness today announced the initial launch of Sun Gems THC infused gummies throughout the company's 42 Liberty Health Sciences dispensaries. So it's another product that they can start you know, pushing out through their dispensaries in Florida, but just want to use this to again highlight this unique market as the Florida medical cannabis market continues to show robust growth with the Florida Office of Medical Cannabis Use reporting over 615,000 registered patients as of last week, up 46% year over year. So when you consider that growth rate, plus the fact that there's a population of 21.5 million in Florida and just 619,000 registered as of this week, there is so much potential for this medical only market, especially as they're trying to get legalization on the ballot for 2022. On to some developments, legislative developments, cannabis lounges coming to Nevada with a host of new laws. A flurry of laws passed by the Nevada legislature earlier this week take effect on Friday, ushering in reforms that Democratic lawmakers who have majorities in both the state Senate and Assembly have long campaigned to implement. A law introduced by Assemblyman Steve Yeager to allow the Cannabis Compliance Board to start accepting applications takes effect on Friday. Once licensed, the lounges will become the first public places in Nevada where cannabis products can be consumed recreationally. The state's emerging cannabis industry has promoted the lounges for their economic development potential and pitched them as a draw for millions of tourists who visit Las Vegas annually but can't legally use the products in places like hotels. But the obvious easy answer is we have bars where people can consume alcohol. Why not have bars where people can consume cannabis? Same idea. On to this, Virginia. Thousands apply for medical cannabis cards in Virginia, so it seems like citizens are the reception from the citizens to legalization is going well. Since this legalization, interest in the flower continues to skyrocket. We see probably around 250 to 300 patients a week, depending on the time of year, Leon recalled. Over the course of us opening, we've seen 10,000 patients. Virginians were able to apply for medical cannabis card on August 2020, when the first sales of cannabis extracts began on October 14, 2020. The Board of Pharmacy spokesperson told CBS 6 that currently 1,000 to 1,200 people apply for medical cannabis card each week. As of September 2020, there are 4,727 registered patients in the Commonwealth. Since September 9th, 2021, the number of registered patients has climbed to 
33,000, which represents growth of over 600% right here. So it's good to see that the Virginians in this red state know the benefits of cannabis and they're taking advantage. But just so unfortunate of CBS6 to highlight, you know, this is the hope of an alternative medicine that's going to stop deaths from the opioid epidemic, but we can't give you hope without showing you a picture of someone that looks like they've got the complexion of an addict smoking a tobacco cigarette can't have the hope without the fear, I guess. Just wanted to highlight that as I thought it was kind of funny. On to this, Nebraska advocates launched signature drive for 2022 medical cannabis ballot measures as activists in Nebraska on Friday unveiled the language of a pair of initiatives to legalize medical cannabis in the state. Supporters now have until July of next year to gather thousands of voter signatures to put the measures on the 2022 ballot. The petitioning drive to qualify the two initiatives will begin Saturday in Lincoln near a University of Nebraska football game at Memorial Stadium where advocates say they plan to take advantage of the crowds and kick off the big effort. And I imagine they will. So together, the two initiatives from Medical Cannabis um, NMM would protect qualified patients from legal consequences for cannabis and regulate businesses that produce, distribute, and sell cannabis products to those patients. Advocates say they're done waiting for lawmakers to act on the issue and will instead take the issue directly to the voters, which is a smart thing to do because last year, cannabis was going to be on the ballot in Nebraska, but a lawmaker pushed cannabis off the ballot for online gambling. Imagine that. You could have saved many lives by putting cannabis on the ballot for medicine, but instead, no, you got more people addicted to gambling. While well, Florida backers are trying again to legalize recreational cannabis, after the Florida Supreme Court struck down an earlier version, a political committee has filed a proposed constitutional amendment aimed at legalizing recreational cannabis use. So this new version, however, is significantly different from the earlier proposal, which was framed as regulating cannabis similar to alcohol. Sensible Florida would need to submit 891,589 valid petition signatures and get Supreme Court approval before it could take the new version to the voters. It would need to be submitted it would need to submit the signatures by February 1st deadline to get on the 2022 ballot. So good luck, Florida advocates. I hope you can get this done. Well, which states will legalize recreational cannabis next? It's just another article presented by Green Entrepreneur. I'm not going to read through all of this, but it will be below if you want to grab it. And just to highlight again, which states may legalize cannabis in 2022? Because if you think this genie is going back in the box, you are mistaken. We've got Delaware, Maryland, Missouri, Arkansas, Ohio, which is a big one, population of over 10 million, Oklahoma, and Wyoming. So lots of promising uh, developments to come in many other states that, again, have not reformed laws. And just keep in mind, only 18 have reformed their laws. That means there's another 36 that have yet... No, I don't think that math is right. The opposite of 18, 32. <laughs> that means there are another 32 states that have not yet legalized their laws um, and that will be doing that in the future because... The plant is just that good. You can't really deny it. As we see the momentum keep building week after week, then we got a study from Normal. Twin study, adolescent cannabis exposure, not an independent cause of psychosis in adulthood, which is a big finding. Cannabis exposure during adolescence is not independently associated with either adult onset psychosis or signs of schizophrenia, according to longitudinal data published by the Journal of Abnormal Psychology. Researchers affiliated with the University of Minnesota Institute of Child Development assessed the relationship between adolescent cannabis use and adult onset psychosis in a longitudinal co-twin control analysis. Scientists identified no dose-response relationship in models that compared the greater cannabis use twin to the lesser use co-twin with respect to psychosis proneness in adulthood. They reported no differing effects on subject levels of cannabis exposure and their later risks of schizophrenia, which is very big because some studies have linked schizophrenia and psychosis to early cannabis use. So this contests that. Researchers reported epidemiological studies have repeatedly shown that individuals who use cannabis are more likely to develop psychotic disorders than individuals who do not. It has been suggested that these associations represent a causal effect of cannabis use on psychosis, and that psychosis risk may be particularly elevated when use occurs in adolescence. The study, however, does not support these hypotheses, suggesting instead that observed associations are more likely due to confounding uh, by common vulnerability factors. So it's not just cannabis, just there are other factors. They concluded the results suggested that this association is likely attributable, attributable to familial confounds rather than to a causal effect of cannabis exposure. Our results suggest that the threat of potential harm to adolescents via meaningful increases in risks of long-term psychotic illness may be overstated. Thus, clinical and public health interventions aimed at decreasing the prevalence and burden of psychotic illnesses may benefit from focusing their attention elsewhere and continuing with the cannabis reform. And just on top of that, as I've relayed study after study, just got to end with this sad reality is that the DEA still insists cannabis has no accepted medical use, which is just ridiculous, highlighting that the laws in place have nothing to do with health. It's all about control, which is very sad, um, but it's important to see these realities so that we can try to fix them. So just going to read from this. 
The CSA gives the DEA the authority to reschedule drugs in consultation with the Department of Health and Human Services. The National Organization for the Reform of Cannabis Laws filed the first petition asking the DEA to reclassify cannabis half a century ago. Half a century ago! But neither that case nor subsequent challenges made such headway because federal courts have deferred to the agency's interpretation of the CSA scheduling criteria, and everything's up to interpretation. According to the DEA, marijuana has no currently accepted medical use because it does not satisfy a five-part test that the agency invented, which demands a sort of evidence that would be required to win approval of a new medicine by the Food and Drug Administration, yet we can't study it because it's still in the CSA. So in the DEA's view, the fact that most states allow patients to use cannabis for symptom relief is irrelevant, yet 40-some states have legalized cannabis for some form of medical use, and this is the Drug Enforcement Agency, the agency that can tell you what drugs you can and can't take. How ridiculous! So again, just highlight, it has nothing to do with public health. It's all about control. And the DEA knows that they're losing their stranglehold, so I think it's more important than ever for you to try to join this fight if you can, if you live in a state that has yet to reform their laws. It's just absolutely insane and again highlights has nothing to do with public health. It's all about control and keeping that control for as long as possible, but thankfully they cannot fight the momentum because we've come a very long way. And again, please just join this fight if you can to try and help this change finally happen. Lastly, we just want to show you free cash flow as he also has a U.S. cannabis comp sheet similar to the U.S. cannabis investor portal um, that you can use as a reference. And so I don't think it shows as well here or as visibly, but you can obviously grab the link below. But this has all the tier one US multi-state operators, the tier two MSOs, the tier three MSOs, and the tier four. This is US cannabis multi-state operators only. There are no Canadian LPs in this one, whereas the US cannabis investor portal has US MSOs and LPs. But these are two great resources that break down market cap, net debt, enterprise value, stores, fact set sales, estimates for 2021, 2022, 2023, their compounded annual growth rate going forward, EBITDA estimates from 2020 to 2023, EBITDA margin up to 2023, enterprise value divided by sales, and enterprise value divided by EBITDA. So thank you, Free Cash Flow, for making this and putting it out there so that people could do their own research with it. Um, Got to respect all the uh, OG cannabis investors, especially those that, that are willing to share this sort of information. So you can grab that below if you want, but that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and I really hope you got some value out of it. But what did you think of the stories mentioned? Please let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, but I'd love to know what you think about the True Leave merger closing or what you think Schumer's next steps might be. But if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on it, subscribe if you don't want to miss any more, and I will catch you on Wednesday for a midweek update. Have a great weekend, everybody.